Hey guys, what's up? This is Todd from Animator Kid. We've spent hundreds of hours watching events take place in the Star Trek galaxy, a version of the Milky Way galaxy filled to the brim with all kinds of ancient civilizations, strange planets, and other cosmic activity. And a few times throughout the series and movies, we've seen visualizations of different planetary systems and even entire quadrants. Some dedicated writers and fans have even gone as far as to publish entire books or websites dedicated to star charting the Star Trek galaxy. Galaxy, including Jeffrey Mandel's Star Trek Star Charts and StarTrekMap.com, all of which lay out various locations in the Star Trek galaxy on expansive grids. But here's the problem that most attempts at map making in the Star Trek galaxy have run into. They try to project locations in 3D space onto 2D planes. This is simply a misleading way of depicting the relative locations of different places in the Star Trek galaxy. This is not to say that authors such as Jeffrey Mandel were being purposefully misleading when creating tools such as star charts, but the fact of the matter is, in order to get the best, most accurate picture of where different places are in relation to each other in the Star Trek galaxy, we're going to have to construct a 3D visualization. So today I'm going to try to answer the question, what does Star Trek's Alpha Quadrant look like? Now, over the past few years, in addition to making awesome videos for YouTube, I've also tried to figure out what exactly a 3D representation of the Alpha Quadrant would look like. Today I'm going to be using Universe Sandbox to help us create our visualization. The first thing that we need to realize is that the Milky Way galaxy is very, very big and very, very crowded. That is to say, a top-down view of the Federation and its neighboring powers is much more complicated than those 2D maps lead on. This is why certain elements of Star Trek's astropolitical scene are not easy to interpret in 2D publications such as star charts. For example, several episodes of Deep Space Nine make reference to the existence of a Cardassian-Romulan border, even though on most 2D maps of the Alpha Quadrant, Romulus and Cardassia are on opposite sides of Federation space. Even if this border is temporary during the Dominion War, it still begs the question of where exactly these powers are located in relation to each other, and just how they're oriented in 3D space. One solution for this problem is for the bulk of Cardassian territory to be located above Federation territory. That is to say, most stars in Cardassian space would be equivalent to stars in the Northern Celestial Hemisphere or the northern sky. There is some evidence to back this up, even on those 2D maps, especially the ones in Star Trek Star Charts that place the Romulan claimed Karaya system next to Cardassian territory. This is how the Dominion was able to infiltrate the Klingon Empire without having to cross the Federation, like a highway. We can actually recreate a small portion of local space by plotting a few real-world stars and placing fictional worlds around them. For example, real-life stars such as Tau Ceti, Alpha Centauri, 40 Eridani, Pollux, 61 Cygni, and others correspond to known locations in the Federation's sphere of influence. Immediately, it becomes clear that some of these stars are located above or below the galactic plane, which means that when they're projected onto 2D space, some liberties have to be taken in order to conserve space. As we zoom out even just to a 40 light year radius, things become infinitely more complicated. There are thousands of stars located in this area, with hundreds of bright stars visible. But the relative closeness of space, just a few days travel time at warp 9, provides some flexibility in determining just how far these systems are from Earth. With the exception of a few ultra-bright stars such as Rigel and Antares, the further out from this two-sector radius we go, the more warped the projection becomes. That is to say, the location of certain stars along the galactic compass used on most TD maps becomes almost meaningless. For example, the Deneva colony is commonly accepted to orbit the star Kappa Fornatius, which is 72 light years away, even though Star Trek star charts depicts it as being less than 30. However, this becomes partially reconcilable when we take into account that Kappa Fornatius is 23 degrees below the celestial equator. Thus, it becomes very difficult to equate fictional worlds in the Star Trek Alpha Quad with real-world stars, unless we know their location in relation to other real-world stars. This is partially because any attempts to view the galaxy from a top-down perspective changes dramatically the further away from Earth the observer travels. You know, because space is three-dimensional, if I didn't mention that already. From what we can gather, though, we can roughly estimate the relative locations of the various interstellar powers in relation to each other, based on the locations of the different constellations and stars within them. For example, with Earth placed in the middle 
of the Federation along the Alpha Beta Quadrant border axis, we can still place the Romulan and Klingon empires to the east of the Galactic Meridian, just like they are on 2D maps. The Cardassian Union and Bajor may be located above Federation space, again, according to the Northern Sky, but if they don't share a border with the Romulan Empire, we may still be able to place them to the west of Federation space. Other smaller powers such as the Gorn and the Metrons are also located to the east of the Galactic Meridian, next to the Klingon Empire. The Tholian Assembly is also likely located above Federation space, because Star Trek Star Charts places the star Omicron Cephei in Tholian territory, which likely extends into the northern sky. We can gauge this because when the Tholians, who were otherwise isolationist, interact with other species outside their territory, it is often with interstellar powers on both sides sides of Federation space. Other powers such as the Breen, Ferengi, Zenkethi, and Sheliak are also likely located to the west of the Galactic Meridian, although their territory extends towards Earth, which explains the level of interaction between these different powers in Star Trek. Clearly the Federation is among the largest of these powers due to its expansionist nature, a concept I'll explore further in the next episode in my Star Trek Future History miniseries. Of course all of this is simply what's located within a 10 thousand light year diameter, or 10% of the Milky Way's total length. We may never be able to know exactly what the Alpha Quadrant looks like without having to do extensive research in constructing a 3D visualization that would take quite a bit of time. I just wanted to scratch the surface and establish that the real locations of these different places would be much more complicated than those 2D maps lead us to think. As for the Gamma and Delta Quadrants, it would be next to impossible to apply this method to stars located in those regions of the galaxy, because the galactic core is in the way of our telescopes. So until we obtain a model of what star systems really do look like over 30,000 light years away, Star Trek Star Charts is just as accurate as any model in depicting locations in those quadrants. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like and comment, and don't forget to share it. If you want to support me on Patreon, click the element on the end screen. Don't forget to subscribe, and don't forget to be awesome. Live long and prosper.